Seismic profiles like this one from the Inamore Firth show structures that we may well interpret as faults. But what's their real geometry? Well, faults are well understood structures in structural geology, and we have ideas about their orientations, whether normal faults have particular dips, whether thrusts have particular dips, and so forth. But the challenge is that many seismic displays are distorted because they're shown in two-way time, and indeed are commonly shown with very high vertical exaggerations. So in this short video, we're going to look at the image distortions that occur around faults on seismic profiles, and then look at the importance of trying to look at these without much vertical exaggeration. And we're going to look at the impact of doing that versus not correcting for vertical exaggeration can have on the way in which we look at faults. So let's start off here, which is part of the floor of the Ionian Sea, just offshore Italy, and you'll see that the seabed there has a break in it. Let's zoom in. There we go. Well, let's interpret that break as if it is a fault scarp. It looks like it is because the geology on the right hand side of the scarp in the bedrock there has a different seismic character than on the left. So let's imagine there's a fault there with that sense of throw. In other words, it's a normal fault down throwing towards the left. Now, you'll notice that around that fault that I've picked on this image, the seismic quality is substantially degraded into shadow zones, which I'll just add some illustration over like this. Within these areas in here, we can see on the hanging wall that the seismic quality, the seismic energy is scattered, so the reflector amplitudes are decreased as you approach the fault planes. On the right hand side, you see a similar effect together with those um, smiles, those migration artifacts where the reflectors sort of turn up and make apparent sinformal shapes, which are entirely seismic artifacts. The seismic quality in there is also degraded with this so called shadowing effect. And this is because seismic energy is bounced off the fault plane and uh, so doesn't penetrate the foot wall so clearly as it does the hanging wall. But even the hanging wall shows scattering because of rather complicated ray paths with the seismic energy bouncing off the fault plane and then back off stratal reflectors and so forth. So we have a lot of image degradation around our fault. The effect of this degradation of seismic image around the fault that I've picked there can be misleading in terms of where you might want to pick the fault itself. You might want to pick the fault like this, tying the fault trajectory to where the reflectors apparently terminate in the hanging wall, in which case you draw your fault to have a significantly reduced dip compared to the trajectory we showed originally. Or you may choose to think of the fault coming in that trajectory along the edge of the strong reflectors in what was the foot wall on the right hand side but now it's the hanging wall because the fault is inclined to the right in fact therefore we'd infer that the fault was a thrust not a normal fault so the way in which we interpret the image radically changes the structural interpretation now the next thing we need to think about is the scale We've not really considered that yet. Look at the scale on the top left hand side. The horizontal scale bar is two kilometers long. The vertical scale bar is 500 milliseconds long. The effect is that the seabed on here shows significant vertical exaggeration. Let's reconstruct this image to make it more like a vertical and horizontal scales equal using the seismic velocity of seawater. And we'll just do this in PowerPoint by stretching the image, or in other words, contracting the vertical scale of the image like this. So as shown on here, one second two-way time for seawater would be approximately 750 meters of water depth. So as I'm showing it on here, this is shown for the seabed at approximately vertical and horizontal scales equal V equals H. So that's a better representation of the form of the seabed. And there goes the fault that I picked before. 
If you do this, you may be able to pick some of the reflector continuity into those shadow zones rather more clearly than we did in our zoomed in, vertically exaggerated image that we were looking at before. But again, you can still see that the image is distorted in the proximity of the fault zone. And I've just picked out the shadowing effect of the fault because of energy scattering. Okay, let's return to the examples of the Moray Firth. Here we go. We're going to look at two of our fault zones on here. Notice the scale. We've got one second two-way time as the vertical scale bar on the left, five kilometers as the scale bar on the bottom. We'll just zoom in at the same sort of scale on this fault zone here. Here we go. So the relationship between the vertical and horizontal scales are the same as in that larger section that we were just looking at. I've just reduced the size of the scale bar on here. 250 milliseconds, vertical scale, one kilometer, horizontal scale. The only way that would be a vertical and horizontal scale being equal would be if the seismic velocity here was approximately eight kilometers a second. And we draw our seismic interpretation something like this. We can correlate reflectors of that green smear that I put through something like this. And um, we've shown the fault continuing to depth, tied into some of the abrupt terminations of the reflectors as you go down beyond the half arrow. But that eight kilometers a second seismic velocity is not appropriate for sedimentary rocks. It's very much appropriate for the mantle, but it's certainly not for sediments. In other words, there's significant vertical exaggeration in here. I'm just going to simply reduce that by a factor of two to this. And therefore, this display would be appropriate for an average seismic velocity that's four kilometers a second, much more appropriate to sedimentary rocks. And we'll see what the interpretation looks like now. And I think we do it like this with our same horizons or same package of rocks picked out in green and our fault plane shown where it is there. Now, this is a different trajectory to depth than the one we showed already. If I go back to this vertically exaggerated version, I tied the continuity of the fault to depth to the termination or apparent termination of the reflector shown by that big fat black arrow down there. If I arrow that on the less vertically exaggerated version, that was the point at the tip of the black arrow where the fault plane went. In other words, um, we assume that our reflectors correlate like this. As I've shown it in this interpretation though, the terminations of our blue horizon, hanging wall and foot wall are shown by those half circles in yellow. Now, the apparent horizontal offset there, the heave of the fault is one way of measuring the displacement in the system. So in the version I've picked here with no vertical exaggeration, we can measure the heave to be this value here. What would the heave be if we showed this fault in its original interpretation constructed from the vertically exaggerated profile? Well, the fault would nip over to here and the heave would be correspondingly greater. In other words, there's a greater horizontal component of displacement on our fault that we had constructed in the vertically exaggerated form. So different fault trajectories have different heaves. Information that may be very important in constructing um, regional structural analysis of a sedimentary basin. This I think is a more appropriate interpretation, a more realistic heave reduced from the version that we created with the vertically exaggerated profile. Let's now go to another fault zone on the regional profile here. Here we are, zoomed in, and again we're looking at it with vertical exaggeration. This would only be vertical and horizontal scales equal if the seismic velocity was eight kilometers a second, as we've seen or discussed. That's far too high for sedimentary rocks. Nevertheless, let's interpret it in good faith using this display. There's our fault. So let's look at it now with less vertical exaggeration. So again, this is looking at a profile with an average seismic velocity of four kilometers a second this time to be vertical and horizontal scales equal. And there's our faults coming through like this with our green package correlating through. So this will be a better structural interpretation. Right, while we're at it, let's look at how the image has been affected by the faulting. 
you'll notice our green rocks are brought up to the seabed here. If I strip away the seismic interpretation, you can see the image quality below that area is strongly degraded. And you'll see the amplitude of our seabed reflector is greatly increased in that region above where it says degraded image. In other words, the seismic energy is having a harder time penetrating into the subsurface. And that's why the seismic image quality is less good here compared to the other areas. So lithified rock at the seabed seems to be degrading our seismic image. The faulting and the geology caused by faulting is having an impact on the quality of our seismic image. In addition, around the main normal fault we got on the left there, the image is degraded because of the shadowing effect that we saw when we looked at the offshore Italian example. So that's a quick look at the impact of vertical exaggeration on faults. When doing structural geology, it's really useful to try and make a display as near as you can to have vertical and horizontal scales equal. This allows you to make better interpretations. So a quick pass two-way time to depth conversion just by pushing your image around is really worthwhile. We've also seen that faulting can create more complicated seismic imaging by bringing lithified rocks to the surface, um, which can create those um, distortional effects because of the problems of energy transmitting across the seabed into the subsurface, but also the fault shadowing effects because of scattering by the fault plane and the juxtapositions of different rocks at the fault plane itself. But rather than finish with this vertically exaggerated version, I'd rather finish with this version, which shows a more realistic interpretation of fault geometries and a more realistic demonstration of the stratal architectures across the region.